Thank you for coming, first of all. Um, secondly, you, you, I, you don't have any handouts today, and that's my fault, because uh, I didn't really want to give you the handouts from today. Um, I'm going to do something a little bit different than any of the previous um, presentations I've given through Lunch and Learn. You're going to see uh, through the many slides that we'll go through and through the things I'm going to say, someone's story, the story of Beecher Trail. Um, his wife Nancy is here with us today, and she, she might want to interrupt me when I get things wrong. Um, but I want you to see what, what happens to Beecher as, as uh, our evaluations go along and as we follow him through his disease. He's still alive and he's still, I saw him very recently, but he's a very changed man. You're going to be seeing him through my eyes. Um, as a physician, I'm seeing him, I'm doing analysis, I'm trying to figure out what he has. And so I'll be talking a little bit about the process of how we diagnose frontotemporal dementia. Um, and you know what those what the characteristics are that allow us to do that. So it's going to be a little bit clinical. You're going to see a lot of n my notes, my, the things that I'm thinking, what what they mean, and, and how I interpret them. And, and I'll try to uh, to the you'll, you'll see that the notes are very technical. But I'll try to sort of bring that in uh, to our discussion so that we can see what the, what the doctor is thinking and what that means in terms of what the patient is experiencing and what it is that we're actually talking about today. All right. Um, I've got a lot of slides, but I, I think I want this to be a, an open discussion. And, and if you have any questions, you should interrupt me as we as we move forward. And that includes people in Elko and uh, the other remote location <laughs> that I forget. So as I said, this is the story of, of Beecher. Um, he actually has a um, a moniker, Beecher the preacher. Uh, which I didn't know, I didn't understand initially, but uh, it, uh, it became clear as we, as we went on. Uh, so he's a 58-year-old right-handed man, uh, and he presented with Nancy, uh, his wife, who, uh, who, who had known him for 22 years, so somebody who knows him very well and who, who could speak very clearly about who he is, who he, who he was, and who he is now, and, and how he's changed. His, he says, I can't get my words out. I can't speak. I'm having trouble expressing myself. And that was very clear to everybody else around him as well, that he was having difficulty interacting with people in, a, in, a, in as a meaningful way as usual. Uh, and there's a, a sort of a one-year history of that. I can't find my words. Nancy described him. He's just, you know, he's, he speaks in shorter sentences. He's using fewer words than he previously did. Um, and he's using verbs and nouns, but he's not using conjunctions as much. So his sentences are very simplified, and he, he's using high content words that say what he wants to say, but it's not very flourished or sophisticated when it comes out. Now, he worked as a contract bidder for an asphalt company, and of course, um, you know, being able to, when you're a bidder, when you're interacting with people making deals, uh, you kind of need language. So he was not doing as well. Uh, at his work uh, as, as, uh, had been previous, as he had previously. He wasn't making the numbers, is what his bosses like to say, and there was going to be a discussion about his performance um, in, the, in the coming weeks. Um, so the language changes, the, uh, describe them a little bit more. He, he, there's a little bit of stuttering, a little bit of difficulty getting the words out, a little bit of sort of this kind of mechanical hesitation when you're trying to get the words out. Um, sometimes he would be very rushed to answer. He would say yes when it, the answer is really no, or no when the answer is really yes. Um, he also had a little bit of difficulty naming objects, at least spontaneously. Uh, so uh, he was a uh, he he, li he liked cooking, uh, was my understanding, and he spent a lot of time in the kitchen doing things. Uh, but he was having more and more trouble talking about the things that he used when he's cooking. In particular, he called a basting brush a squeegee. Um, maybe that m mixes up with his uh, his other lines of work. Um, he had difficulty understanding complete sentences. So if you said something complicated to him that had many clauses and, and the sentence was a little bit grammatically complex, uh, he didn't get it. And you had to simplify things in order for him to understand. And he had mild changes in writing as well. He was making spelling mistakes, uh, which he didn't used to do, and a few grammar mistakes as well. But it wasn't as striking as it was in his speech. Um, we, we, don't, we take uh, everything that comes to us at face value, but we ask a lot of other questions. And so we started asking questions about how is he behaving? Are there any changes in his personality and his interaction with others? It's not dependent on the, 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 the voice or the changes in his speech. Um, and it was noted that he had, he had withdrawn a little bit from his interaction with others, that he was a little bit more isolated. Um, and, and you could argue that that's because he has trouble 
expressing himself and, and interaction with others is not as meaningful. But he had been more withdrawn for possibly one or two years, which maybe predates a little bit when his speech difficulties began. He'd spend a lot of time at home watching TV and he developed an interest in the iPhone and games on the iPad. I, didn't th I don't think Angry he had an birds. iPad quite then yet. I'm sorry? Angry Birds. Angry Birds, yeah. right, already, yeah. <laughs> so he's spending a lot of time um, uh, playing games on, on um, computer screens, let's say. And um, he was actually described as a little bit more antisocial than before, maybe because of his new interest in, in games. But during dinners, for instance, when, when everybody was around the table and having a chat, um, he could just he, it he would he, he could spontaneously you know get up and say I'm I'm done with this and I've got to do, go do something else and go play uh, with uh, his iPhone. Um, this is a significant change from who he was before. Um, uh, Beecher had had some difficulties with um, opioid uh, dependence in the past from, from severe back pain, something that doctors are causing around the, the country these days. Um, but uh, so he had been part of uh, Opioids Anonymous and he, he was a, a very active member of that group. Um, and in fact, he was a very inspirational speaker and people looked, uh, thought very highly of him. Uh, and that's where his moniker, uh, Beecher the Preacher, came from, because he, he was very inspirational, and people did look to him to, uh, uh, for, for help and comfort. Um, but this had changed. Um, he wasn't really interested in people's lives anymore. And I think, I, I didn't clarify this with you, but maybe even in, in his three children, he was maybe less interested in what's happening to them and, and where, what, where they are in, their st in the various stages of life. So definitely a, a different person than before. Um, there are some more, more changes, uh, not because he couldn't call the basting brush, uh, basting brush anymore, but he, he really wasn't interested in cooking as much. He'd withdrawn from activities that he really enjoyed doing, cooking in particular. Um, despite sort of withdrawing from some activities, he, he seemed to get involved m more intensely in other activities. And by intensely, I mean really intensely. Uh, for instance, he was, he was uh, really excited about cleaning. Uh, he wanted everything to be pristine. He would. Uh, he got really involved in, in cleaning the dishes, uh, so he would he would pick up all the dirty dishes and make sure that they were clean and put away uh, as soon as possible. In fact, he would sometimes even grab dishes uh, off the table before people had, had finished eating from them. I thought so, finally got trained. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It may not have been your doing, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so, this is a little unusual. Um, it, particularly the drive that he seemed to have, this kind of sense that it had to be done and he had to, to the extent that he would like, take, take dishes out of people's hands in order to, to get them clean. Uh, so he was very driven by this and it, it became almost ritualistic. Um, he was also never interested in laundry. Um, I, I, I didn't remember this from our first uh, encounter, but uh, he, he became suddenly interested in laundry and he was doing it three times a week. Um, uh, so again, something new that doesn't really fit with, with who he was and what he did before. And again, something very driven, not something that sort of occurs, oh, well, we have dirty dishes or, oh, we have dirty laundry, somebody needs to take care of it. So, no, I got to do it now. Um, another thing that was noted is that uh, he developed a new uh, preference for sweets and, uh, and certain salty foods, um, and uh, he would eat a lot. Um, he would eat uh, pig ears, cinnamon rolls, chocolate. In fact, he gained almost 30 pounds in the many months pre preceding his, uh, his assessment with us. Um, there were some emotional changes as well. Uh, and, and this is a little bit different than what you'd expect. Uh, you'd expect that because he's withdrawn and doesn't really, not really interested in people that he wouldn't react very much to, to, to anything, that he would be blunted in a way, his, that his emotions would be blunted. But in fact, um, he had lost interest in his friends and his hobbies, and he was obviously withdrawn, but he was much more labile emotionally. He would cry in sort of melodramatic movie in, in a way that uh, the big guy that he was uh, wouldn't have done that before. And he was a big guy, he was 200, well, you'll see his vitals in a few minutes. Um, he seemed less concerned about his wife's health as well, so she, I think you were dealing with some issues at the time, some serious issues at the time, and um, it's like he wasn't involved with it anymore. He didn't. He didn't seem to care, he didn't seem to support her as much as one would want um, one's spouse to, to help. Um, 
And in the past, he'd been the first one to stand up and stand up for someone's rights or stand up for, no, this isn't right, we need to do this this way or, or oh, you need help, let me, let me get involved. And he'd become more sort of just accepting of the way things were uh, and more passive. Um, there had been some driving issues too that had developed. Um, uh, his wife expressed these concerns at first. He'd had two accidents in the last two years uh, driving a company vehicle. Uh, he, driving, he was dependent on driving for his uh, livelihood. Um, uh, he, uh, in fact, the company car had been taken away from him because of these two accidents and he was driving his own car. And these were uh, accidents, uh, maybe for, because not, he wasn't paying very much attention or he wasn't judgment was off a little bit. Um, he would hit the curb at times. He uh, drove over spikes, um, the spikes that you, that prevent people from going into an, an exit uh, to a, par uh, a reserve parking lot. So he uh, blew the tires once doing that. Actually, he knew better than that too because that's what he did for a living. Yeah. He go into the apartment complexes and <clears throat> he also actually had five more accidents um, after those. After those? Two. I didn't document all those. That's good. That. Well, that yeah. <laughs> um, so judgment issues. Um, so this is more technical stuff. This is the the, the business that we uh, that we have. We, we need to make sure that we're not missing anything that could be causing um, pr problems in 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 his brain. Um, but his past medical history wasn't very significant. He had um, gastroesophageal reflux disease. He had high lipids. He had hypertension and low testosterone. He'd had a couple of surgeries, but nothing, nothing very dramatic. He'd had some problems with, with back pain and some back surgery, and that's what had led, I believe that's what had led to the, his, his earlier dependence on opioids. Right, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Also, yeah. yeah. But that's, that was uh, not part of his current um, situation. His family history is a little more interesting, and I, I didn't get a chance to explore that, and I wanted to at some point in, in the near future. But his mother passed quite young at the age of 50 from, from uh, alcoholic cirrhosis. Uh, so uh, not something that's very common. And it's a very young age to die. So we can't really speak very much about her otherwise. But uh, you know, what led to her cirrhosis? Uh, what led to her alcoholism? Her fa his father also passed away in his late 50s. So also, again, a young, young death. Uh, he was a very heavy smoker, and he died from lung cancer. Um, he has, the, the history is a little complicated, but he had a half-brother as well who passed away at 52 following complications of a lung transplant. He had a lung transplant and then he was having troubles and mm -hmm. just... Do we know what his original disease was? Why he needed the lung transplant? Um, he had something with his esophagus and I believe he'd always had, um, he had some um, COPD yeah. or, or something okay. there, yeah. We'll try to clarify he that. Wasn't, uh, yeah. He wasn't a smoker, he no. was a tobacco chewer. Okay. He also had three children that I believe are, are healthy. They're, yeah, but they're all my children, not his. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, they're all healthy. Yeah. Um, there's no, uh, in the extended family, as far as we could tell, other than, you know, whatever the mother uh, had, had, whatever led to the mother's uh, substance abuse problems, um, there were no other neurologic, psychiatric, uh, substance abuse or judicial issues uh, in, the, in the more extended family, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. Um, we didn't explore his grandparents, but it might be interesting to do that as well. Uh, his medications reflect uh, his disease, uh, his diseases. He um, was on medications for, uh, for uh, esophageal reflux disease, uh, the medications for hypertension, for elevated cholesterol. Uh, and he also had a bit of difficulties with sleep, so he was on trazodone for that. Um, now, uh, had a fairly normal uh, social history. He was married twice. I, I didn't realize his first three children were with his first wife. Is that right? His three children with, were with his... Uh, no, they were no, your he children, had, not his. Yeah, he had, he had no children with any of his okay. wives. So he doesn't children. have any biological children? No, no not that we know of. <laughs> <laughs> he was in the yeah. <laughs> There's these four years we have to account right for, now. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, four years in the Navy, uh, he had an associate's degree, so he went to college for a couple of years. Um, uh, he lived with, with Nancy, uh, and as I mentioned, he'd worked as a contract bidder, and he'd been fairly successful up, up until the, the recent past. Um, so when I saw him, um, we, we did our, our usual cognitive assessment, and I'll go through some of the details of the things that we do, just to give you a sense of what it is that, that we experience in the clinic every day. 
Um, but he had some mild abstraction abnormalities, some difficulties with abstraction. I'll show you why I say that. Uh, he had mild attentional or concentration difficulties. And his memory appeared to be affected by that. It appeared to be affected by the difficulties in, in attention. He didn't have a clear memory disorder. Um, and he did have a clear expressive language. That he, he had, <laughs> a bit like I'm having right now, clear <laughs> um, expressive language deficits. Um, his language was laborious, effortful, uh, and the number of words that he could produce in a minute was actually reduced. So that's what we mean by reduced fluency. Um, he occasionally would produce sentences that were not grammatically correct, and he could pick up on those every now and then, so we note those. Um, and he was, as I mentioned before, he was using high content words, so words that are very helpful in saying what we want to say, but that minimize how many words we actually need to use. Um, he was able to understand words, so if you say, you know, what's a frog, what's a clock, what's a plane, he, he would be able to tell you what those things are. So he didn't lose the sense of what words are. He just had trouble finding them when he was speaking. <coughs> um, so one of the tests that we do, the main test that we do to screen our, our patients is called a MOCA. Um, it stands for Montreal Cognitive Assessment. And we do it because it's a good test, not because it's from Montreal, which is where I'm from too. Um, but it is a very good test. Um, and he scored pretty well. He scored 24 over 30 the first time we saw him. Normal is 26 or more, so not quite normal. And he lost points, and I'll show you exactly where he lost points, but he lost points for not coming up with as many words as we'd expect. He had lost points for um, similarities, which is uh, sort of abstraction. And he didn't put the numbers or the hands in the clock properly. Another test that we use is the Fullstein Mini Mental Status Examination. That's a much older test. It's a lot easier to do. And as you can see, he scored almost perfect on that test, 28 out of 30. So this is the first half of the MOCA. You can see the first task is actually a very simple task where you have to draw a line that starts at one, where the word begin is, and you have to go from a number to a letter to a number to a letter. You have to alternate like that, and the numbers and the letters have to, to grow. They have to be in sequence. So 1A, 2B, 3C, 4D, 5E. And he did that without any problems. He drew the cube without any problems. That's actually pretty hard to do. Um, most people that don't have a college degree can't do that for some reason. Um, he was able to name the three animals. You can name them in your mind right now if you want. If you're having any trouble, come and see me after the talk. <laughs> um, and uh, as you can see here, there's a, a contour, numbers, and hands. That's the clock. I'll show you the clock in a few minutes. But as you can see, he was unable to put the numbers or the hands properly. Now note the, the words that are written out there. Um, the nurse asked him to, to come up with as many words as he could think of that begin with the letter F in five minutes, in one minute. So you can do that too. You can try in your mind coming up with words that begin with the letter F. And you can see it's not an easy task, but typically most people in one minute can come up with at least 11 words. He came up with uh, one, two, three, six, seven, three, four, yeah, eight. Came up with eight. I'll, I'll point out that there's some of the words there that you probably wouldn't say to your doctor <laughs> or to your nurse. <laughs> Um, and that's also, that's also something that is a, a telltale. It's something that tells us there's something going on here, that somehow he's, he, he, he says things in, uh, that's on his mind without really thinking about whether it's appropriate to say it or not. And it's not something that we had extracted from the history. He, he was polite with people in general, but, but in clinic, still these, these kinds of things happen. He worked in construction, too. So. He, he did. They, now have to they do talk. <laughs> they do. <laughs> well, you, you know, this, this coat, actually has a, a huge effect on people's behavior in general. Um, and when it fails to do that, then, then we, we start worrying. Um, and this is the rest of the test. I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll point out a few other things. The, the memory task, you see that he's asked to remember five words. And so we, we say, here are five words I want you to remember. Face, velvet, church, daisy, red. And he came up with them right away. Face, velvet, church, daisy, red. But we're, we're instructed to, to do this task twice. So although he got it right the first time, we say, okay, let's do that again. The five words are face, velvet, church, daisy, red. And the second time, he only came up with four of the words. He missed one of the words. So his ability to, to focus on learning five words changed from one moment to the other. He got worse rather than better. And that's more a sign, more a, um, it, it suggests that it's not, he's not having problems with memory. He's having problems with focus and registration of the information. Um, uh, and when we tested his memory, 
Uh, he actually did pretty well. He got four out of five. The memory, it, we're testing the memory over here. Does this work on? No. We tested the memory over here. Um, and the only, not, the only word he missed was velvet. Uh, and he was able to recover it with uh, multiple choice Q. He was also fairly well oriented. Um, so let's go back to, uh, well, uh, another part of the test involves uh, drawing the over, interlap, overlapping pentagons. And we asked people to write a sentence. This is a sentence that he wrote, um, I think, reminiscent of probably some of his experience uh, uh, with, o, with OA, um, feeling that I'm responsible for my behavior. It's interesting that he came up with that then. And when I also think it says something about the fact that he's aware that there are issues uh, going on, although he can't quite put his finger on it. This is his clock, and as you can see, uh, he actually put, I think his, my nurse was a little bit rough with him, because uh, I would have given him his points for putting the numbers in properly. W wouldn't you agree? His, the numbers are good here. Um, but the, the hands are not. The hands are supposed to, to indicate 10 after 11, and clearly they don't. Uh, and so he, he had some difficulties understanding how to put the hands properly, and that's also a sign of difficulties with abstraction. His neurologic examination, so I said he was a big guy. He weighed 260 pounds, and he, weighed six, he was six foot two tall, so big, hefty guy. Uh, I'm only 5'9", so I was looking up at him like this, and, um, uh, and very healthy. Uh, his neurological examination was completely normal, and I'm pointing out some things here, mostly for technical reasons in, in the sort of neurologic speak. But he, um, he didn't have any trouble doing things with his hands, uh, sort of showing me how to use scissors and showing me how to, how to use a pencil. Uh, and he didn't have any m difficulties moving his eyes around. And that, that's not so important right now, but it does become important later on as, as his disease progresses. One thing that was noted, though, is that his face was a little bit dull. Um, the word we use is hypomimic, that, you know, when I'm talking, I move my eyebrows around and I try to focus on people and, and, and I, I, there's a lot of expressions and a lot of nonverbal language that comes through my face. Well, he wasn't doing any of that. His face was fairly plain and didn't reflect very much emotions or, or intentions the way you, you kind of need to uh, if you're going to interact normally with people. So we call that hypomimia. He's not a very good mime. Um, he had come from another physician who had done a, a fairly extensive workup, including an MRI and some uh, an EEG and some uh, blood tests and all of that stuff. These are things that we would have done if, if they hadn't been done. These were all normal. Um, let me show you his MRI. I've done this before. I've shown uh, MRIs before, and uh, I always hesitate to do this. But let me, uh, let me see if this works. OK, um, so the MRI, this is the MRI that came to us. It had been done a few months before we saw him. And it's considered, it was read as normal. And it looks pretty normal. There's, there aren't any big strokes. There aren't any big um, uh, tumors. Uh, it's fairly normal. But I would say, looking at it, that there's a little bit of, of atrophy here on this side. And I think all of you can appreciate that, that this side of the brain, there's more black area, more space, than there is on this side of the brain. This, is, this happens to be the left side of the brain, and that's the brain, part of the brain that's responsible for language. So it, it sort of fits with what, what he's experiencing. And let me show you uh, a little bit further down. Uh, yes, the scans, MRIs in, in general, left is on the right and right is on the left. Uh, it's called radiologic convention. It's a little annoying. Um, but yeah, things are inverted. And I'm pointing this out, because it doesn't happen very often, but as you can see here, just above the eyes, there's an area where these are, this is called the orbital frontal, so around, uh, over the orbits and in the front part of the brain, there's uh, thinning of the cortex there as well. Uh, so that's a very important part of the brain for um, focusing on, uh, on um, sort of proper social behavior. Uh, and in his case, because we know of his history, because if we know what's been happening to him, we look here a little bit more than the radiologist might have, and we say, wait a minute, there's something there. This is thinner than I would expect. Um, I think maybe I'll skip this one. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, that's not, not as helpful. And I'll skip that one, too. Um, so, 
so the, the, the MRI, although red is normal, I think we were thinking, wait a minute, there's some changes going on in the frontal, in the orbital frontal area, in the frontal lobes, and also in the area that's responsible for language, and that kind of fits with what's happening to him clinically. Um, our, in our usual workup, we, we'll, we'll uh, particularly for somebody who's doing well on the, on the MOCA, like a 24, that's certainly very strong, we'll, we'll test him for a, in a little bit more depth. We'll do a neuropsychological assessment. And in the case of young of patients that are young that are having difficulties where the MRI is sort of normal, we also frequently order an FDG PET scan. That's just, and I'll show you that in a few minutes. So this is the neuropsychological assessment. Um, my wife is a neuropsychologist. In fact, she, she's the one who did this. Uh, and she, she cringes every time I say that I can reduce what, all, everything that she does to this one graph. Um, what's, what's important here is that there's a lot of difficulties in language, uh, a lot of difficulties in executive function that's kind of doing many things at the same time, focusing on different tasks. Um, a little bit of trouble with learning and recall, but less, less difficulties with recognition. That pattern is not at all the pattern that we see in Alzheimer's disease much more a pattern that we see in patients who have problems with the frontal lobes. So again, things are converging and, and it looks more and more like the pathology, the, the difficulties that you're having are related to, to problems with his frontal lobes. Um, this is the CT scan. Yeah, and this is the, let me show you the PET scan. So on a, on a PET scan, again, th this is a test that we order fairly frequently. I say maybe one fifth of my patient, one fourth of my patients will get a, a PET scan. Um, uh, it's the one that's in color. Uh, and what you see when, when you look at a PET scan is uh, how much the brain is using sugar. Uh, so we inject radioactive sugar. It goes all over the body, but in particular, the brain is the most uh, avarice, uh, avarice, is the part of the body that, that eats up the most glucose. Um, so the, the, redder, the, the redder the signal, the more red it is, the more active that part of the brain is. And typically, the whole brain, the whole outside of the brain where the cortex is should be all red, and in the middle is where it should be sort of bluish. And what we're seeing in his case, and I'll, I'll point this out, is that there's a little bit, there's areas here in the left, temp, left temporal lobe over here and in a little bit higher up here, um, and that's a, an, an area called the insular cortex, where the activity is clearly not as, as high as it is on the other side. You can appreciate that? Yep. Yeah. Is it possible to find the Broca's area on that scan? Um, Broca's area, it's hard to see specific brain areas on PET scans because as you can see the, the it's kind of more blobs than it is precise locations. Um, Broca's area... Is it possible to find it on the MRI? Yes, yeah it is. Although not, uh, although again not as simply as you as, as one might like. Um, Broca's area is approximately here. So that's the frontal, it's the Technically, it's in the uh, posterior part of the left inferior frontal gyrus. And that's approximately where it is. And he doesn't actually have a, def a, a, a lot of atrophy of that particular area. Um, but I believe that probably connections to that area are damaged. You, you might argue that there's a little bit here. And w when we look at the PET scan, it's a good question. When we look at the PET scan, I think we're probably talking about this area here, being Broca's area. So you're right, that's a, a, a significant, it's an area that we're very interested in because he does have language problems. Broca's area is the area, for those of you who were at my talk on language a couple of months ago, um, we, we looked at Broca's area in a lot of detail. Um, Broca's area is where language is put together, where the structure of the sentence uh, is, is sort of where the, the words and the verbs, the nouns, the adjectives were all put in the right spot and, um, and where, where the, the sentence is constructed so that we can utter it. Um, so I think I've painted a picture uh, already uh, of, of Beecher. 
that allows us to come to a conclusion that his, his difficulties are related to disease of the frontal lobes and potentially the left temporal lobe uh, area that's responsible for speech. Um, so I'm not going to ask you to come up with a diagnosis. I'll tell you that I think he has frontotemporal dementia. Um, because he had some difficulties with language early on, it could, we could have said that he had primary progressive aphasia, which is progressive loss of language that might then continue to worsen and start evol evolving other parts of the brain and ultimately causing difficulties in behavior that would then lead to an additional diagnosis of frontotemporal dementia. But in his case, I believe the diagnosis out front was not primary progressive aphasia, although that was the presenting complaint. I think the diagnosis up front was frontotemporal dementia. I'll tell you why, uh, and, I'll, and we'll go over the criteria um, just so you can get a sense of what it is that we're doing when we're asking all these questions and why, why do we want to know this and why do we want to know that. Well, we want to know that to see if he qualifies, if, if the, he has enough of the changes in his, in his exam and in, in, in his history to support the diagnosis of frontotemporal dementia. Um, the diagnosis of frontotemporal dementia these days is based on uh, criteria that were developed in 2011, so they're fairly recent, and criteria that, that had evolved from previous criteria from 1998. Uh, the previous criteria were actually kind of poor. We had a lot of trouble making a diagnosis of frontotemporal dementia with the previous criteria. But the new criteria are actually a lot better. Um, in fact, the sensitivity, our ability to detect the disease, uh, has increased from 53% to almost 95% um, with, uh, with the new criteria. And they're much more specific as well. If, the, if we have probable frontotemporal dementia based on criteria, um, we're, we're right about 95% of the time. That's really good in, in, our, um, in, in our field. These are the criteria. Um, so I show you this, uh, uh, it's a little bit overwhelming, but this is what we're going through in our head. Does he have this? Does he have that? Does he have this? Does he have that? Uh, and, and the more boxes we check, the more c confident we are that, that that's the diagnosis. So I've simplified this a little bit um, in uh, this uh, uh, slide. So these are the things we're looking for. So to have pos the, the diagnosis of frontotemporal dementia is either possible or probable. So for it to be possible, you have to have at least three of the six things that are written there. And if in addition to those uh, three of those six things, you have the other two items that are under probable, then you have also probable disease. So let's go through that with him. Is there behavioral disinhibition? Does he behave in a strange way, in a way that's kind of inappropriate at times? Yeah, I think so. I think we can check that box. Is there apathy or inertia? Does he get involved in things as much as he used to? Or has he withdrawn and he's not, not interested in, in things around that he used to be interested in? Yeah, I, I think we can check that box too. Has he lost empathy or sympathy for people around him? Is he less interested in his wife's health or the fate of his children or the people he used to be close friends with in OA? Yeah, he has. So we'll check that box too. So already we have pro possible disease, but he has more. Um, perseverative, stereotype, compulsive, ritualistic behavior, his cleaning behaviors. Check that box. High plurality and dietary changes. So he's eating a lot of chocolate and a lot of pig ears and he's put on weight. And, um, so yeah, that, that fits too. So if you notice the five first things we, we talked about in the five first boxes we checked are all based on history. They're all based on, on what we were told about him and some of the things that we see in clinic, but mostly things that we're told. And finally, the sixth one is a, um, uh, executive deficits on cognitive testing. So I showed you the neuropsych testing and I showed you how the executive function was one of the places where he had the most difficulties. So we can check that box too. So he has possible frontotemporal dementia. Does he have probable, probable frontotemporal dementia? Well, has there been a functional decline? Does the MRI or the PET, find, or PET scan support the diagnosis? Is there atrophy or hypometabolism, loss of the use of glucose in those areas that fit with the diagnosis? Yeah. So he has, he fits, we, we, we're checking all the boxes. It's, this is unusual, it doesn't usually happen that way, but in Beecher's case it did. Um, so, I, you know, the conclusion after two visits is that, yeah, we are dealing with behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia. 
Um, and it's probable. It's the most likely diagnosis. Um, I thought I'd make a, a comment on uh, his use of words uh, during the, his, when he was asked to come up with words that begin with the letter F. It turns out that people with frontotemporal dementia tend to be the only people who will do that in clinic. And that's a very sensitive finding. Uh, one in five patients with frontotemporal dementia will, will say uh, words that you probably shouldn't say in clinic, uh, as opposed to Alzheimer's disease patients who tend never to do that. So again, a little telltale that, that kind of betrays the diagnosis. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's an example of, I think, that inhibition, that he knows it's not right. He wants to say it because he's driven, because you're standing there writing down the words that he's saying, and he wants to put up more words, but he held back. Well, it's the first thing we think of when we're setting up words. It, all, <laughs> yeah. it might be a new, new finding in this yeah. generation. <laughs> <laughs> so it's yeah, it's common. Can you say... I'm sorry? Can you tell us... I don't disagree with you that it's the first thing you think of, but it's not the first thing you say. No? If I put you on the spot and say, come up with words that begin with the letter F, and you, you, you know, you're seeing me for the first time in clinic and I'm evaluating your cognition, um, you're probably not going to say um, those words. And you have your code on. I'm sorry? And you have your code on. Yes, yes, the code is the big uh, <laughs> deterrent. Thank you. That's the word. Um, so. So I mentioned this a little bit. Uh, could this be Alzheimer's disease? It could be. Sometimes Alzheimer's disease can look like this, but I think behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia is the most likely diagnosis, and that's based on current clinical criteria, and he really checks all the boxes. Um, could we say that this was the ag agromatic variant of primary progressive aphasia? We could, um, but I think that his behavioral changes probably preceded his, um, his problems with, with language and that we're dealing with something that was initially behavioral and so the diagnosis of behavioral variant FTD remains. So that's how we do it. Um, and on the third visit when, when we go over the PET scan and, and uh, the results of the neuropsych testing, uh, that's what we say. I think this is what we're dealing with. What does that mean? What's going to happen to him now? Where will he go? Um, how will he evolve? Now, um, the, the, I'm, I'm, uh, I spent a lot more time talking about him than I thought I would. Uh, I'm going to skip over a lot of these slides, but on, you know, I want to say a little bit, a few words about FTD. Uh, only, so simply, uh, frontotemporal dementia is a clinical term that, that's used in clinic to describe a disease that, that affects people. And it's due to the progressive disintegration, the progressive atrophy, the progressive um, shrinkage of certain brain areas in a very focal fashion. And those brain areas are the orbital mesial frontal cortex, the insular cortex, and the anterior temporal cortex. I showed you those areas in all the scans that we just looked at. But here they are in, in, a, in, a, in a diagram that makes it a little bit more obvious. But these are the brain areas we're talking about. The front of the brain, the, the front polar area of the brain, the front underneath, just over the eyes, and then a part inside the brain called the insula, um, the tip of the temporal lobes, and the cingulate cortex, which is an area that's responsible for motivation. And you can imagine that these areas are areas that are, are relevant um, to the behavior that we're talking about. Um, unlike Alzheimer's disease, the pathology inside the brain, what's going on inside the brain, is very different. In Alzheimer's disease, everybody who has Alzheimer's disease has plaques and tangles, everyone. But in frontotemporal dementia, um, there's different types of pathology. There's only one pathology in any one person, but there can be very different pathologies from, from one person to the next. So it's not a single disease entity the way Alzheimer's disease is. And frontotemporal dementia, in this particular case, started as difficulties with behavior. It, it will evolve. And depending on where it goes in the brain, it can start causing other kinds of problems. Um, the kinds of problems that it can cause can either involve movement, movement disorders, and people can start looking like they have Parkinson's disease, or they can involve the neurons that control muscles. And in that, when that happens, people develop neuromuscular disease, or ALS, motor neuron disease, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, a, a very bad diagnosis. 
Um, frontotemporal dementia is probably actually more common than we think. We, we believe that it probably accounts for about 10% of all dementias as a whole, which is a big number because there's a lot of dementia. Um, and uh, it's probably more common than Alzheimer's disease in the young <coughs> age group. So in, in below the age of 65 is it at least as common, if not more common, than Alzheimer's disease. Um, <coughs> is it triggered by a blow to the head or anything like that, or is it hereditary? Yeah. Um, probably not triggered by a blow on the head. Um, not triggered. Um, but if you have a blow on the head and you damage part of your brain and then a disease sets <coughs> in and that part of the brain is already damaged, there's a likelihood that the manifestations of that disease, that the clinical, the, the appearance of clinical signs or of uh, difficulties with cognition will appear sooner if the brain was damaged. Um, there's a disorder called CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is the disease that boxers and NFL players. <coughs> so it's a disease that's still a little bit controversial. It's a tauopathy. It's caused by the accumulation of tau. About half of patients with frontotemporal dementia also have tau, but it's a different kind of tau. It's a tau that accumulates in a different way. So your question opens up a whole uh, Pandora's box of problems that I won't get into. Um, so I mentioned that it starts somewhere and then it evolves. Uh, so frontotemporal dementia starts as the disease suggests, as the name of the disease suggests, in the frontal and in the temporal lobes. Um, and that's different than Alzheimer's disease, which tends to start in the temporal and the parietal lobes, or Parkinson's disease, which tends to start in the brainstem. So where, what, what kind of disease we're dealing with and where it starts determines you know, what, it, what it will look like clinically. Once it's started, we, we'll get signs, changes that fit that part of the brain, that, that are consistent with damage to that part of the brain. But then as the disease evolves and the, the abnormal proteins progress to involve other brain areas through, brain, through neuron, neuronal networks, um, the disease will, will change with time. Um, here's a picture of a patient with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, as you can see, uh, the, the brain is very shrunken, uh, but it's diffusely shrunken. This is a picture of a patient with frontotemporal dementia. So as you can see, the part of the brain that's involved is the frontal lobe, and it's almost the only part of the brain that's involved. So it's frequently called a focal uh, dementia. I'm going over a lot of uh, sort of technical things, but, um, and I mentioned there's abnormal proteins like the amyloid and the tau that accumulates in Alzheimer's disease. In frontotemporal dementia, there's at least three different kinds of proteins that can accumulate, and there's probably at least two more that we haven't discovered yet. And I would say, it, um, I would say at least uh, for, for the, the two most common proteins, the tau and the TDP43, the second kind, it accumulates in different ways. So there's some patients that have certain kinds of tau accumulations, other patients have different types of tau accumulation, and that leads to different kinds of diseases. So we, we don't think that they're the same disease. They involve the same protein, but the protein distributes and, and, and um, forms abnormal uh, accumulations in the brain in, in different ways. So it's a disease that's actually many diseases, and we don't entirely understand yet how to separate them out while people are still living, <coughs> although we are working very hard on that. Um, and finally, in, in part, in order in answer to your question earlier, uh, frontotemporal dementia is much more of a genetic disorder than any other dementia that we have. Um, about 40% of patients will have a clear history of someone in the family having suffered from a similar disorder. Somebody like, um, where it's obvious that, the ge that there's a gene being passed on from grandparent to parent to, to, to um, affected individual and potentially to children. So it's a disease that we're very interested in genetically, in part because we, we might be able to, dis to discover or to find people that are going to suffer from the disease before they actually start suffering from it, and potentially start finding cures that are going, and that are going to be very specific. Um, here I'm describing the, the different kinds of um, additional disorders. I talked about Parkinsonism, uh, disorders that look like Parkinson's disease and amyotrophic and ALS. Uh, so I describe those there. I, I don't want to go into too much detail about that. Um, and I said that uh, that as the disease evolves, the, the the disease can take on different forms as it moves as it uh, as it worsens. 
And in the case of, of uh, Beecher, we could have postulated that he started with an aphasia and then he evolved into a behavioral disorder and then he could potentially evolve into a Parkinsonian disorder. Uh, or uh, he could have evolved from the aphasia directly into a Parkinsonian disorder and then developed the behavioral disorder. Or he could have stayed um, with the aphasia and, and never developed anything else. So this path, these different paths that the disease can take, we don't know. We don't know ahead of time what's going to happen. Um, so I've, I've got a couple more slides about the next few visits I had with him. Um, but this is nine months after I saw him, so the second or third visit. He had been involved in another motor vehicle accident and he in fact lost his license and lost his job. Uh, so this caused a lot of problems. You lose your insurance um, and you can't come and see us anymore and so you have to go to the VA instead. And, um, he was eating a lot more. He was very, very interested in food. He was kind of had a tendency to sh shove the food in his mouth. His speech had become very, very pressured uh, and he was often coming up with words that didn't make any sense when he was speaking now. He was more impulsive. Uh, he wouldn't sit still. If you sat him down uh, and then you started doing something else, he was up and walking out of the clinic. Um, and uh, on examination now, he had changes that fit uh, a Parkinson's disease. So he was starting to be a little bit rigid, a little bit stiff, a little bit more on the right than on the left. So that's what we mean by the bilateral cogwheeling. That's something that we see in Parkinson's disease. And his, uh, on testing, his, his cognition is failing. He's, he's getting more deficits on, on testing. So he went from 24 to 19 on the MOCA. Um, so he, he was deteriorating. He was getting worse. Uh, but something interesting was happening as well. Um, uh, I think probably, uh, uh, I wouldn't say out of desperation, but I've I got to find something to do with him, right? right. Uh, let's take him, I like he's what I, yeah, he's yeah. a full-time carer, so let, let's try to get him involved in doing something that's interesting. What do you like? I, I like, you like watercolors, yeah. so let's, let's have him uh, come to, to, to our drawing class. Uh, and he started doing watercolors. Uh, this is some of his watercolors strikingly um, like beautiful colors, beautiful interpretation, lots of the, the, subtle, um, the subtle use of the shades, it's, it's, just, it's astonishing. And you would never have thought that would come out of somebody who, whose mocha is failing and who's having difficulty speaking. Um, a couple more examples of, of his work. Absolutely striking. Um, uh, he's a truck driver, right? He's, uh, well, he's a truck driver, yeah. <laughs> um, so very, very different. Now, we weren't expecting that at all. Now, is this new, this kind of idea that somebody uh, who's developing problems with speech and, and possibly frontotemporal dementia uh, develop an interest in, um, in painting or colors or uh, art? Uh, um, I thought I scooped, I, I, had, I thought I had a, well, I, pe I speak of this with pride. Um, you know, it's a sad story, um, but when something very striking happens like this, it's, it's news. It's, we want to understand why this is happening. Well, it's, it's not big news because it, it has been shown before. Um, in fact, it's been published in a, in a beautiful paper written, uh, in, published in Brain, a very, very influential uh, journal in our field in 2008. Um, and this is a, the story of another uh, patient who suffered from exactly the same disease as Beecher did. Uh, who also developed an interest in, in painting, although not watercolors. And she also developed an interest in bolero, in the bolero, in the piece of music um, um, written by Ravel. Uh, so this is some of her work. Um, and you can imagine drawing this sort of thing takes a lot of obsession. It takes a lot of, sort of being driven to, 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 to all of the detail that goes into drawing something like that. Um, and this is what, what was happening to this, this woman. Her name is Anne Adams. And this is some of, uh, her, uh, some of her work as it evolved in time. And underneath is her MRIs as they were changing in time. And as you can see, the areas of the brain that are involved in her case are exactly the same as the area of the brain that were involved in, in Beecher's case. Um, just to um, uh, push home the, the idea of, of this being driven, this is her rendition or interpretation of the number pi. If you know the number pi, 3.295, does anybody know the number of pi? No. <laughs> um, it's a, a number that, that uh, with an infinite, uh, infinite sequence of numbers that never repeat. Uh, and uh, so this is how she interpreted the, the number pi in her pictures. 
And this is how she interpreted the bolero. Does anybody here not know the bolero, the piece, the bolero? I should probably have a, um, a recording of it. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a piece that involves drums and um, I think a trump, um, a clarinet probably. Uh, and the, the, there's a certain rhythm in the piece that just doesn't let go. It's just constant rhythm. Progresses. Yeah. Uh, and it does. It, it progresses, progresses very, very slowly. But the, the rhythm is, it, it's, it, it's driven. Uh, and, and you can see what she did here, she spent a lot of time trying to understand the, how that rhythm progressed, how the nuances of, the, the, of the, 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 the horn section as well progressed. And she coded all of those things using different colors and different schemes. And this is how she represents the, the piece, the bolero. Um, this is Ravel. Uh, some people believe that Ravel actually also suffered from this disorder and that at the time when he wrote the bolero, he might have been experiencing the same kind of driven uh, urge uh, to produce things. Um, and some, some have suggested that the bolero is the consequence of this kind of disease. This is Ann Adams. Um, I'm just going to have you listen to her for a few seconds. I would like you to take a look at this picture. I think some of you may have seen this before. Time. And please tell me what you see. And if you can, please try to speak in sentences. Okay? Take your time. I know this is a little bit difficult. Three. Um, people. So she was specifically asked to speak in sentences. And what she's doing is pointing and naming. That's the best she can do. And she's having a lot of um, trouble. She was a biologist. Um, Dog. And I don't know if you noticed, but she's only using her left arm. Man. Her right arm's not moving. Mm -hmm. Female. Um, so about a year and a half after I saw Abitra the first time, uh, he started developing more problems. He was falling more often. Uh, he was choking, in part because he was putting too much food in his mouth. Um, he was obsessed with his bowel habits. Uh, his voice had become almost inaudible. He, he, the tone, the, the, the volume of his voice had dropped to the point where you, you kind of had to he sit right beside He whispered everything, yeah. Um, and he had very few words now. He could, he could spontaneously use a few words and he could name objects, but he wouldn't be able to, con to have a conversation with you at all. He was more rigid, physically more rigid. He wasn't moving his eyes around uh, as well as he was before, but he was continuing to do his watercolors this is some more of his work. And I, I don't know, I, I'd like to put his, his works in, in sequence, but I think that, he could, that, that there's some changes taking place in his work that uh, could represent both that he's having more trouble, but I think they also represent a little bit of his appreciation of what's happening to him uh, and may, may reflect this kind of sense of, of loss. 22 months after I saw him, still more isolated, um, I think he, at this point, he was, uh, he, we'd found an, uh, something that would occupy his attention um, and would keep him out of trouble, uh, but he would play Angry Birds on the iPad all day. Um, he would not uh, speak uh, spontaneously. Um, he, was, he would remain motionless sitting in his chair at home uh, unless he was requested to move or often he had to be brought to move. Um, and I'm throwing in there a few other things. His eye movements became very, very restricted. And this is, for me, this is telling me where we're going. Uh, he's developing a, a Parkinsonian syndrome that we call PSP, or, or CBD, or a little bit of both. Um, 28 months, so two years, uh, th a little bit more than two years after I saw him the first time, uh, starting to develop some problems with incontinence. Uh, much more frequent falls now he has to be looked at, uh, has to be, uh, somebody has to be with him whenever he tries to move. And he's nearly mute. Um, he's also having trouble swallowing his saliva, so he's drooling on the sides of his face when we see him. Um, and finally, 33 months after, um, the only thing he can do is tell you whether he's happy or not happy. Um, we worked very hard to get him to give us a thumbs up every time we saw him. But. Uh, he would become a little bit more agitated when he wasn't able to communicate what he wanted or when, when things around him became uh, 
uh, sort of anxiety provoking to him. He was also unable to do simple things like show, like use a fork or a spoon or um, or hold a pen properly. So he was using the ability to do these complex tasks that we take for granted. That's that's a phenomenon called apraxia. And he was much much more rigid still. Um, this is him. Uh, I want to I just want to show you. Not the man that you imagined when I described him the first time. He's, he'd lost a lot of weight by now. And um, I'm going to try to show you. Don't, uh, I'm trying to make him look at my nose. And so I'm pu pushing, pu I'm, I'm bouncing my finger on my nose constantly. And it's very annoying. So please don't look at me, look at him. Uh, so as you can. Keep looking at my nose. So you can see he, he's unable to follow me. His eyes are. Can't look, can't look down at all. Can't look up. Get my nose over here. Let's go up again. Okay. And now I try to move his head a little bit. And as you can see, his head is tied to his chest. It, it, they don't move. They're they're one piece now. And that's the rigidity that we see when a Parkinsonian disorder becomes full blown. Now I'm trying to. I'm going to try to move his arms a little bit, and you'll see how stiff, stiff his arms are. And you can see his muscles are contracting like this, spontaneously. It's called myoclonus, and that's something that we see in advanced cortical basal degeneration, part of the Parkinsonian disorders that he's evolved into. Um, I, I think uh, I'm going to stop there, M maybe only to point out that this started three years ago. A man walked into my office and uh, had a bit of trouble with speaking, and now he's completely mute, has trouble swallowing, can't, can't move his arms or his legs. Uh, he can express a little bit what he's feeling, and, and we get that sense when we speak to him. Um, but he's, he's stuck. He's stuck in this position um, for the rest of his days. Um, it's, a very, it's a very aggressive disease. Three years is, uh, is not, uh, you know, most, cancers, most cancer people live longer than three years. So this is a malignant disease that's really uh, taken away Beecher's uh, ability to be with people and now even his ability to enjoy any aspect of life. So it's very, uh, it's devastating. Uh, from a, a, a clinical point of view, I, you know, as a physician, I have to take that hat off and stop worrying about that and, and say, well, what, it, what, it, what, it, what does he have exactly? And, and I, you know, I think this, is, this was frontotemporal dementia that then evolved into one of these Parkinsonian syndromes. He went from being um, ambulant and conversant and working to being, um, I'm going to call this terminal. He's in the last phase of his disease. In, in only three years. I think in his case, the pathology, if we were able to look at it, would probably be, te would probably be tau. Um, that might not seem like a very important bit of information right now, but in the, in the near future, we're probably going to have medications that will attack tau and stop tau from accumulating. And so knowing that this kind of person evolves in this way will bring us to give medications of that kind uh, and hopefully stop this. And as I mentioned, uh, this is a very genetic disorder, uh, one uh, that can be passed on from uh, parents to children. Um, and his, in his case, there's, a, a, there's, I think, a strong likelihood that maybe his mother had a similar disorder and it wasn't catched because she, uh, she passed away from something else before. And um, I'll stop there with his la one of his last paintings. All right. Um, I'm, I've gone over. Well, I started a bit late, but I've gone over. Um, if uh, I know Nancy's here, and um, I, I wanted to give her the opportunity to say a few words, uh, you don't have to, of course. But uh, I hope I, I did justice to to, to him and uh, to to the, the um, to his experience, which has not been easy. 
what you didn't see in all of this, I mean, I, I said this was going to be the clinical um, approach, you know, what happens to, 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 to the patient in the clinic, and, and I, I kind of stuck to that. But there was a lot of other stuff going on um, socially, um, when he lost his job and he lost his insurance, and um, you know, Nancy trying to work through how, what, what we're going to do and how we're going to do this. And so th there's a lot of help that comes not from me, the doctor, but from the services that we have here and from other people, like the uh, uh, Association for Frontotemporal Dementia, whose um, who's week it is this week, um, to try and help families and, and, and people like Nancy the who are, is about to end. Who are uh, dealing with this. Um, it's really important that we recognize that that's happening, and that's what this week is about. It's um, uh, the Food for Thought uh, week. Uh, for the Association for Frontotemporal Dementia. Nancy, do you want to say a few words? Sure. I, yeah? Uh, I just want to say that uh, <sighs> it's been the most devastating challenge in my life. Because he was such a man of so many words, such a great personality, and this disease has taken away every good thing about him, his speech, his heart for other people, and just the kind of person that he was, and wanting to always help people, and to see him decline so much, and watching him die over and over and over the last few years. It's been horrible. And uh, I'm just thankful for Dr. Legere and the LaRubo Center and all the support I've gotten because I couldn't have done it without them and my family who's been a big support to me. And I just pray that they will find a cure someday because no one should have to go through what we've been through or what he's been through. And I think that he, he wouldn't even want to be here if he knew, really knew what was happening. But one th the thing I am thankful for is that throughout part of it, he's had somewhat a sense of humor at times. And he's also been, uh, uh, I know he still knows me. So it's not like Alzheimer's where he doesn't recognize me. And sometimes his eyes light up and he opens his eyes wide and I know that he's still in there, you know, somewhere in there. But at this point, I just pray that this journey is going to be over soon because it is very difficult. I just want to thank you, Dr. Legier, for all you've done help me, helping me through this journey with him and my family. We all appreciate you very much. And my husband does have, did give Dr. Legier a book with all of his paintings in it. Yes. And they are chronologically in there. Okay, so I'm just about that. Yeah, just and I have found out recently there were some other pictures he gave away that I never got a chance to take a picture of because he just loved showing, giving them to people, you know. So, anyway, if you know anybody, you know, that has these symptoms, you know, I would just say just try to get, find as, get as much information as you can. And the support group here has been wonderful. Lisa Raiden has been my very special friend and has helped me a lot um, through the support group and and just dealing with everything every step of the way. So if any of you have loved ones that are have this disease, just just stay strong, keep yourself healthy. That's what I try to do every day. So thank you for coming. Um, there's some actually some reading out there on frontotemporal dementia if you're interested in it and I'll, I'll take any questions. Uh, it might be easier if, for those who have questions to come up.